Well, it's pretty quiet, Calvin. I'd say let's yep. um, go ahead and uh, we'll turn it over to QBuild and have them talk about CADLink and their CAD CAD to or CAD to inter, ERP integration. Awesome. Hey, Naoki, I'll go ahead and make you the presenter here. Don't All right. To share your Let's mouse see. and keyboard with you, but now whatever you end up sharing is what goes on the screen. Hey, we got parts up there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just give me a second. Like this. And I'll go ahead and mute myself out. Let's see if I can make a whole control my computer here for a bit. All right, Kaho, you got the control, I see. That's good. Um, we don't hear you, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sh you should be able to hear me now. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I hear awesome. you now. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Kaho from QBuild. We are the um, Epicor Alliance partner specializing in CAD to Epicor integration. Um, before we get started, um, special thanks to Christine for making this virtual EUG happen. Um, I agree that you can never really replace a face-to-face -face conversation um, presenting in front of everyone or standing at a booth at Insights for you guys to come by and ask us questions. But given our, given our situation and how we get more news every day, e even every hour, I think this is the best way for us to stay connected while we stay at a safe distance away from each other, stay um, safe and healthy. So thank you for making this happen. And um, Dakota Bears as well, thank you for um, letting us use your GoToMeeting for this. Um, so uh, what we will be sharing with you today is how um, you can improve your engineering workflow with CadLink. So CadLink is our flagship product um, that integrates the build materials between your CAD data and your Epicor data to synchronize between the two, reduce the amount of manual data entry that you have to do, overall streamlining and improving the workflow between the um, engineering side to the Epicor side. So... So a little bit about us before we get started. Um, so uh, myself, Kaho, is the um, Epicor Partner Sales Manager here at QBuild. So um, after seeing this presentation, if you are interested in learning more, if you want to see a um, deep, more deeper dive, dive demo, um, you have some questions, I will most likely be your main point of contact um, along with your Epicor Account Manager. And Naoki here with me today. Um, he is our senior SC. He'll be doing the majority of this presentation. We'll do a quick demo of CalBlink during the session as well. And um, again, if you are interested in learning more, if you want to, if you want us to show you a demo of our solutions to um, the rest of your team at a later date, uh, you will likely also be working with him as well. Um, typically, both of us, along with a um, couple more of our colleagues, attend the Insights event. We typically are a gold, uh, gold sponsor. We have a booth. Um, so hopefully, we will see everyone at Insights um, in 2021. So before we um, go into um, our solutions, just a quick history and um, just to talk about who we are. Um, so we started, QBuild started in 2007. That's when um, our flagship product, CalBlink, was born. When our owner at the time, who was a engineering manager, made a simple uh, tool, a script that pushes his um, AutoCAD build material information into a database um, system that his company was using at the time. So this was the very first CAD link that we created between um, from AutoCAD, the CAD system. 
And then since then, um, we created another application, ECM Manager, which Naoki will also go through later on. But this is um, a add-on to CalpLink to streamline the process even more to make your engineering change approval process um, e easier than a paper process or an email chain. And at 2010, we reached our milestone of 100 customers. Uh, we, we have continued to grow. Um, and at this point, we um, we have also reached our much bigger milestone of a thousand customer. Um, in terms of our relationship with Epicor, we have become a alliance partner in 2011. So we've been partners with um, Epicor for almost a decade. So we have a very close relationship with um, the Epicor team. We constantly work with your Epicor account manager. So again, if you have any questions about um, CalpLink or any of the solutions that we are showing today, you can either reach out to myself. Um, we will have our contact information on our slides later on, or you can also um, contact your Epicor cam and they will be able to help you out as well. So um, I'll pass this on to Naoki from here. Um, so he will walk you through um, some of our main solutions, um, do a quick demo of CalpLink, um, and we we will have a deeper deep dive session later today, I believe at 3.40 uh, Central. So if you have any questions, if you want to chat more, uh, please join us then. Or if you have any questions, uh, quick questions that you want to ask right now, use please use the chat window or we'll leave our contact information at the end of the slide um, later. So you'll be able to connect us direct, um, to contact us directly. So um, if you have any questions, please uh, let's say, stay connected in um, whatever way is um, easiest for you. And having said that, I will get Naoki to take over from here. All right, thanks, Kaho. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, uh, this is Naoki. Uh, one of the SE from uh, Cubio Software, and I'm going to go through the rest of the presentation talking about um, the Calnic integration first, which we will focus on you know, streamlining your engineering process, right, between engineering and the Epico ERP system. Now, as you can see, we do have other products. So I'll be talking about some of these other products that works with Calnic and how you can you know, further improve your productivity and efficiency, but we also have other products that interface out, out, kind of outside of Calink. And I'll be talking about that as well, you know, uh, kind of seeing what other ways we can facilitate automation you know, with Epico ERP system, right? Not just with your CAD system. So um, my goal today is to kind of show you how we have accomplished successful partnership with some of our Epicor clients to uh, some of the case studies and testimonials, uh, as well as showing you a quick demonstration. Right? I'm going to start with sharing one of the story with Matrix Industrial Automation. Uh, they are an industrial automation equipment manufacturer, so they make all kinds of different robotics that goes into different factories. Right? Very complex product, engineer to order. Uh, they have been using Calink for past three years, probably coming up almost four years now. And they have four engineers using Calink on their CAT system. The challenge they had when they came to us um, was that they were having a very strong company growth, which was a very good thing, but that was hindered by a very lengthy Bill of material entry process. The process they had before Calink involved um, Excel, Bill of material export. So it was kind of a two step process, right? Where engineers use their SOLIDWORKS CAD system, get the Bill of material in Excel data, and it goes through several people and ultimately ends up in the Epicor system, right? It touches multiple departments like IT and purchasing. It, it was a one to two week process to get all of their bill of material data in. That's a, that's a long time just waiting for the data to arrive in Epicor right? because the design is actually already done by the engineer, but it still took one to two weeks to get all the bomb data and item data updated in Epicor. They also had to rely on 
um, generating a flat bill of material. So they couldn't have, even though their, their product is very complex, that involves a lot of different sub-assemblies, the bill of material in Epicor, because of this process, because of how long it was already taken, they had to result to a flat bill of material. It's, it, they basically simplified it to just a list of materials. Um, and they had a very high volume in terms of the bomb entry. Right? There's a lot of product that's being designed in engineering, but also there are a lot of changes that's been made constantly to their product. So uh, the matrix president, uh, Mr. Pat Burchi, you know, they said, you know, they're having exponential growth, right? That's 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 a good thing as a company. Um, and because their engineers are such a critical function. He said, we want them to be designing. I don't want them to be spending time keying in extra data. Right? That's that's probably one of the, the main takeaway from this quote that he she shared with us. Right? We want engineers designing your product, improving your product, not spending time just keying in extra data. Right? So that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on. Now, the success we had with Matrix, with Calum, uh, the bomb entry process went from the one to two week process to one to two hours. Right? That's a that's a drastic reduction in the the time that it takes for the data to arrive in Epicor. That is that means you know you have one to two weeks more in actual purchasing and production because people can actually start doing this with the data that's present in Epicor. Um, it's a direct integration from engineering, right? It, it doesn't need to go through IT. Uh, it doesn't need to go through multiple departments to get the data in. Um, they also said Calink was flexible and easy to customize. And with this, they were able to have the indented bill of material with all the assemblies um, so that you can you can manage the production much better in Epico. That was one of the goals. Right? They wanted to be able to have a true indented bill of material that they can manage. And they, they were successful with Calink. Uh, you know, as an automation company, they said, you know, we're looking at ways to automate our own process and practices. And Calic was a great partner to help us do that, right? So that was that was a great success we had with with Matrix, uh, helping them with automation, improving efficiency, improving productivity, and improving accuracy. Now, I want to share a couple more testimonials from our customers that, that we, we work together. Uh, one of them is McCoy Global. They they manufacture these, again, complex machines for oil and energy industry, big machines, engineered to order. They've been counting customers since 2013, so they're definitely one of the one of the um, earlier customers that we have, and we've had a really good relationship with them. And they also have four engineers using Calvin, updating the bill of material in Epicor. Now, one of the things I wanted to um, mention here, um, you know, Mr. John Snyder from McCoy, they said, you know, their Calink now sets Epicor values by default for all parts, populates UDF fields, stores PDF file path, right? Not not just parts and build, just not just creating parts and bomb and methods in Epicor, but setting certain values based on the logic, populating their specific UDF fields that they use themselves, and also bringing in those file attachments. So that is very critical. Um, feature that we're going to talk about today, the importance of some of these, uh, you know, additional data, additional files beyond just basic part numbers and the film zero quantity. And our last customer that I'm going to share with you is Granko Clark. Uh, again, they make a big machine. Uh, they're a manufacturer of extrusion heating and handling equipment. Again, ETO, engineer to order. Uh, they've been also been customers since 2013, and they actually have 14 Calink users. They have quite a large engineering team, and each engineer has this Calink tool so that they are able to update Epicor with their parts and bomb data. Now, one of the things that I want to point out with this testimonial from Mr. Jeff Ryan, the IT manager at Granco Clark, is that this part right here. With Calnic, now I don't need to worry about data consistency between my systems anymore. Right? That's that's one of the main challenges that a lot of the manufacturing companies face when they have ERP system like Epico implemented. Without these kind of a integration between engineering, 
because now you can end up with inconsistent data between engineering and the rest of the company, like production and purchasing, because they rely on the data in Epicor. Engineers got their own CAD data. We need to make sure they are consistent. We need to make sure they're in sync, right? So we want to get rid of these inconsistencies. So here's a quick summary, some of the common um, pain points that we see across discrete manufacturing companies, right? So when we looked at all those three uh, uh, customers um, who have implemented Catlink, they were growing engineered to older companies, right? They had a very lengthy bill of material entry process. Either they were doing it manually by hand or relying on a cumbersome export import type process. They struggle with data silos, right? The CAD engineer system and Epicor system not talking to each other, ending up with inconsistent data in these data silos. They struggle with a bottleneck, right? Just like the, the very first example we talked about matrix where their bottleneck was just getting the data into Epicor. The design was done. We want to start purchasing. We want to start production. But we have to wait one to two weeks before the data becomes available. Right, that's a bottleneck. And they were all looking to automate and increase efficiency. Right? They, they said, you know, uh, you know, we had enough with the current process. There's got to be a better way. And they, they, they looked for a solution to automate and increase efficiency. And these are all very common pain points. Um, right? Not just those three clients. You know, hundreds of customers we have. That we talk to, uh, to to see how we can partner with them, implement this calling solution. They struggle with manual data entry, which can result in human errors. Right? Someone have a typo in a quantity, and now you get the wrong number of quantity, uh, you know, wrong number of items you purchase. Right? Not enough show up on the shop floor. Too much shop show up on the shop floor. Right? And it's also very. Um, Inefficient way in terms of time and resource, right? And engineers, they're very expensive people. They, you know, they they are great at designing, but we, you guys, don't pay them to sit there and copy these part numbers into the core. Um, they also, <clears throat> there's also commonly uh, used export import process. Um, the matrix was using that. It touches multiple people. It's not very quick, and Oftentimes, there's lack of validation, and it's not a bi-directional integration where data kind of flows one way. You kind of blindly push the data from engineering into the ERP using this Excel CSV files, and you hope everything is correct. And the data silos, right? Inconsistent data between engineering and production shop floor purchasing. So all of this results in all kinds of bad things, right, for companies like the design process, there's a slow engineering because they can't focus on the design work. They have to also manually enter in data, right? With inaccurate data, you might end up with wrong build, wrong inventory, shop floor errors that cause scraps, reworks, which cause delays, which, you know, can, can damage your company reputation with your clients, and there's just overall frustration in your company, right? These are the common pain pain points that manufacturing companies have that we aim to resolve. Now, when we talk about, uh, you know, when you think about these kind of automation, you need to think about the return, right? You need to think about how much money are we going to save with this more efficient, more accurate way. Now, this is just a very quick rule of thumb that we came up with, you know, with, with 15 plus years of talking to manufacturing companies, dealing with these kind of uh, integration and automation project. If you are in a heavy engineer to order a company where you have an engineer all day in CAD designing their product, making changes to their product, each engineer is creating about an hour of data entry that they have to do in order to make sure that their Epicor system at the end of the day is up to date with their new product or the changes they they made in product. Calink will reduce that to literally just minutes, right? From hours into minutes. And if you think about eight engineers, a team of eight engineers just working in CAD, creating product, making changes to your designs, 
by implementing Calink, a solution like Calink, and freeing up their one hour, you pretty much save one whole body in engineering, right? Eight, eight engineers, eight hours a day. By having Calink, you just freed up eight hours of engineers time in a day, right? That's, that's one whole body in engineering. But that's not, not all, right? The time saving is just only one aspect of it, only half the equations. The other half is the accuracy, right? How much you know, errors do we get? How much scraps? How much late shipments do we have? Because the data doesn't get into Epicor quickly enough, because there is uh, uh, errors in the data in Epicor, right? Someone made a mistake when they're typing up the quantities or part numbers, right? What's the, what's the financial impact of those inaccuracy or, or the, uh, the bottleneck in getting the, the bomb bit into Epicor? And, and that, that gives you the total saving. And most of our project, we have the payback period of less than six months, less than half a year, right? And if you look at this from the you know, overall business impact point of view, at the very left-hand side, at the user level, you benefit with a cleaner data, more accurate data in Epicor. You have the confidence in your data in Epicor. And there's also a less data entry for the engineers, which they like. And when you go up, we're talking about freeing up engineering and production resources, making sure, make sure they're focusing on the actual value added activities, not just copying data. Right? And you're looking at the higher project throughput. And all the way at the high level, business value level, you know, you're looking at the better overhead ratio, using your resources more effectively. Now, I think that's, that's me enough talking about the Calink integration and, and why some of these companies struggled before Calink and why they implemented this tool. Um, let me show you a quick demonstration of the Calink product. I'm going to exit out of this PowerPoint presentation. Let me switch to this CAD model. So, um, the CAD link is a direct integration, as I mentioned a few times, with your engineer's CAD system, right? Whether you use SolidWorks, Autodesk Inventor, Solid Edge, Creo, these are all typical, you know, very popular 3D CAD systems. Maybe you use AutoCAD, right? AutoCAD, AutoCAD Mechanical, those are 2D CAD systems. Or maybe you have an electrical design team, right? Altium, Orcad, Pads, Orcad Electrical. We work with all of these different CAD packages, and out of those CAD systems, your engineers will be able to run Calic. So it's like an add-in. Mechanic is almost like an add-in that engineers will find in their CAD system. And basically, whenever they finish designing something, in their CAD, right? Whether it's a 3D model, electrical schematic, a 2D drawing with a bill of material, it doesn't matter. Once you finish in the CAD, you run CalLink. And CalLink will directly communicate with your CAD system. And it's, it's extracting all the information like part number, revision, description, right? The, the bomb relationship, the parent child relationship, the hierarchy, the quantity information, right? All of that. Calink is extracting directly from your CAD file. There is no exporting data into Excel, CSV, or XML. There's none of that. It starts right inside a CAD system. And as Calink extracts all of that data from the CAD, Calink is also creating a live connection with your Epicor. And the screen where we see the bill of material, this grid, this is the bill of material. You can see the indentation that shows the multi-level hierarchy of the 3D model that we saw. And you see these columns that populates part number, revision, description, quantity. This is the bill of material that, that we found in that CAD model. And the reason we have all of these colors, these highlighting is because CADLink made a direct connection with Epicor during the launch and it ran the comparison between these two systems. Every time engineers using Calink to update Epicor, they're not just blindly pushing the data in. 
Kalanick runs the comparison for them, and we use these highlightings so engineers can easily visualize what kind of change you're about to make. Am I creating a new part? Am I creating a new bomb? Am I uh, adding part, removing part? And what are we doing? What, are, what kind of change are we making in Epicor? All of that is being shown here in this visual interface with highlighting. So let me quickly explain some of these different scenarios, these different colors that you might encounter. <clears throat> so for example, these rows in green color, that is a built-in line item that does not exist in the Epicor Part Master database, right? It doesn't matter if it's sub-assembly, purchase part, manufacture part, top level, finished good, part number, it doesn't matter what it is. This part number does not exist in the Epicor Part Master database. Those are green. Green is new part number Calnic will create in Epicor for you automatically. Right, we can, we can create it, assign a part number, assign a revision, assign a description, and assign all the other Epicor related fields like part type, you know, the measure class and inventory, you know, measure, product group, part class, all of these fields are shown in the column here. And I can use this drop down list to make sure that these data are populated correctly before I hit the save button, <clears throat> ensuring some of these Epicor specific informations are also set correctly. Now in this demonstration, if you notice, these green items have a part number that just says XXX. This is because I'm, I'm enabling one of our modules, which I'll talk about uh, later on, um, which allows you to generate part number automatically using Catalink. Right? So you have a couple different ways. You can have engineers assign a part number to your CAD, and Catalink can read that CAD property and use that part number. Or if you don't want engineer to generate the part number themselves, you can also uh, have one of the module that we have um, we have with Epicor, which you can purchase to automate part number generation. Catalink can automatically find the next available part number in Epicor and use that for you. So green is new, white, basically without the green highlighting, if the row comes up in white color, that part number already exists, right? That's an existing part in Epicor. Whether it was created by hand or by Catalink, doesn't really matter how, as long as a part number exists in Epicor, Catalink will recognize. Now, that brings us to the yellow highlightings that we have on some of these columns, some of these fields. The yellow doesn't highlight the entire row. It highlights a specific field because it shows field level discrepancies. All right, so once Catalink finds, using the part number, Kelly found that yes, this part does exist both in your CAD and in your Epicor Part Master database. Kelly doesn't stop there. Kelly then checks, well, what about the description? Because that's a common, you know, a property that's shared between CAD and ERP, right? Epicor has a description, CAD property, typically engineers will give it a description as well. Do they match? And whenever you see a yellow highlighting like this, Kelly is letting you know you have different descriptions in CAD and ERP you have a discrepancy. You need to resolve this discrepancy and synchronize to make sure we are using the same description, same nomenclature in both CAD and ERP. And in counting, I can just right click and easily view, right? As an engineer, I'm looking at this and say, oh, here's my CAD description, that's right. Apparently this is what I have in Epicor. They're a little bit different. Which one is the one I should be using? Right? Which one is the, uh, the description that meets my company standards. You simply choose here. It's a simple mouse click. You choose which one is the right one. Or you can even change the description. If I found that neither of those descriptions are up to the company, I want to fix them both. I don't need to close out Catalink. I don't need to log into Epicor and change it there and then open up the CAD and change it there. Instead, I just change the description right here in Calnic. And by saving, Calnic is going to bi-directionally update. Right? It's not just updating the Epicor description, but it's also able to write back to your CAD property and update to make sure your CAD 
also stays consistent with what's in Epicor. Right? So this bidirectionality becomes very useful, um, allowing engineers to, in some cases, clean up or fix their CAD property data which is very useful, especially in the beginning. Many of our customers in the very beginning of starting to use CalLink, they face a common challenge that is our CAD data is not as clean as we thought it was. There's discrepancies found all over the place and, and we actually need to correct some of these properties in the CAD side. Right? Every time you're using CalLink, we find these discrepancies, we help engineers resolve these discrepancies with this bi-directional updates and over time, you're gonna have less and less discrepancies. As long as you are stay diligent with the new designs that you create, we are slowly cleaning up your older CAD file as well to make sure it's got the correct information on the property. Now, the last color we have is this gray item at the bottom. <clears throat> the gray represents some bomb component has been taken out of the design. Right, so this gray item is currently in my Epical Bill of Materials because it used to be part of our design. But in my latest CAD model, this component does not exist anymore. It's been completely removed or maybe it was replaced with a new part. So this old one is being obsolete perhaps, right? So that would be a case where you see a gray item and that's Calvin letting you know I'm going to update your Epic or Builder material by removing this because it's not in your CAD build material anymore. So all of these colors allow engineers to very easily review what they're about to do, what they've done in their CAD, and what changes we need to make in Epic or to make sure they these two data matches. Without this comparison, without these color highlightings, it can be quite time consuming and quite difficult to pinpoint all the different line items that needs to be updated in Epicor. Right? This needs to be done by hand, right? Someone is looking at line by line. Okay, I changed that quantity. Let me update that, right? It's very time consuming. <clears throat> now, a couple more things I wanna quickly mention is that there are other features in Calling that will help you populate additional information beyond what we see here. For example, what if we have a part in our in our Epicor bill of material that does not exist in CAD? Right? Everything we see here is what's on the CAD right now. Right? Whatever is designed in CAD by the engineers, it shows up as a part of the bill of material. And we can create and save that in Epicor. But what if that part is not found in our CAD bill of material? Our engineers don't model that. Right? So come on examples of that could be things like consumable items, it could be fluid, adhesive, lubricant, oil, grease, it could be packaging, it could be user manuals, it could be like documentation that goes out with it, right? All of these type of items that's not part of the design, so it's not in the CAD design, right? It's not, it's not an engineer's CAD bill material, but we need to make sure to add these in Epicor for costing, for inventory, for shipment purpose. How do we handle that? In CalLink, we have a functionality that allows engineers, while they're in this interface, we allow engineers to manually add items to this bill of material as well. All I need to do is just right click and, and what we call add manual part. This is a functionality that's designed to allow engineers to manually add part to this bill of material. Right, it's got this uh, separate color to show that this didn't come from the CAD. This was added by an engineer or, or someone in CalLink manually. Now, I don't need to populate this row with, with the part numbers and descriptions manually. I, I don't need to type that in. Instead, I'm going to do a search. Using CalLink, because this is a direct integration with Epicor as well, I have the ability to do a live search, live lookup of a part that I'm looking for. Right, whether it's glue or adhesive or, or packaging or bolts, nuts and bolts, you know, whatever that might be. You can do a search, search by part number, search by search by description, up to you. All you need to do is just find the right item 
find the right part in your Epicor that you want to add and hit accept. And we populate this row with the data automatically because this, this is already in your Epicor system. We can get all the data in Epicor. And all I have to do is say how many, right? This is a quantity uh, of this specific bolt that I want to add to this bolt, right? So this is how you can add non-CAD items to your Epicor bill of material. Even if it's something that is not part of your CAD bill of material, you can use CalLink to add it. What about operations? What about method of manufacture? Right, it's it's not a it's not something that's typically found in the CAD bill of material, right? It, it, it's not these operation details, these routing details are not found in the CAD typically. So how do we handle that? Well, once again, we have the interface here in CalLink. Right, if an engineer wants to assign an operation, the method of manufacture to this assembly or subassembly, uh, the one that you pick here, I can either manually do it. Right, assign operation based on the list that you see here. Right, this is coming from Epicor. We're going to do some welding and we're going to do some assembling, put in the sequence number, and fill in the rest of the details. Or use what we call operation template, which allows you to basically copy the method of manufacture from an existing part number in your Epicor. So this part number in Epicor already has these method of manufacture signed, and using Calink, we have operation template functionality that allows you to copy some of these part numbers and their operations. Much faster way than doing it by hand, right? You can now use this as a starting point and edit by adding, removing, changing these operations or values here. But this is how you can also assign operation, the method of manufacture through Calink as well. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, talk about one more feature and go back to the presentation. Uh, but once again, you know, we do have some time uh, out there for, uh, uh, for the counting deep dive later this afternoon. So if you have very specific questions, deep dive questions, you know, come through that session in the afternoon and we can talk about uh, other features that I couldn't show today. But one last thing I want to talk about um, is messages. Now, in the counting screen, under the messages, right now we have no messages. This is a good thing because this is where you'll see error messages. Right? We talked about in the presentation, the accuracy in Epicor is critical. All of the comparison and highlighting that we have been talking about is one way how CalLink will help engineers improve accuracy of the data, right? This this allows engineers to easily visualize the change and, and, and the discrepancies so they can resolve it. They can validate to make sure that the, these are the correct bomb data. But in addition to that, Calink also runs its own data validation for things that are not allowed in Epicor, right? There are certain things you, you're not allowed to do in Epicor, right? Epicor has certain rules, certain standards that, that, that requires engineers to, to follow. You can't leave the required field missing, right? You can't enter a certain value, certain and in, in, in character uh, into a field, right? There's a limit to a certain character limit to a field. The parent and child cannot have the same part number. The bill of material doesn't make sense if the parent and child has the same part number, right? These are some of the basic rules that, that exist in Epicor, things you, you're not allowed to do. Calnic is checking for those kind of errors. So you don't have to, the engineers don't have to worry about that. We will let the engineer know if we find those critical errors. In fact, the Calink Save button will be grayed out. This button in the top left, the Save button will be grayed out if Calink finds even one error in this bill of material. And that is a sign for the engineer to come to the message tab, read what the message says, and resolve that error. So that's also very important. <clears throat> now, once engineers, you know, finish validating this data, finish adding additional details that's required, then do a save. The act of hitting the save button, that's when Calink actually communicates with Epicor, create and update all the part records in Epicor, use ECO group ID to create and update revisions, make changes in the bill of material, create a new bill of material. All of that's being done automatically. 
within just a few seconds. Right? You don't have to sit there, copy and paste, and type in all of these data. <clears throat> now, let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation uh, once we finish saving. <clears throat> So have about 20 minutes, that's good. So changes successfully committed. I'm gonna do a quick refresh to show you what the bill material looks like now in Cali, because now we have new data available inside the Epicore. What you see is that it's the same bill material, but the colors are different, right? It's all white. There's no green, no yellow, no gray. Because all of those discrepancies, those changes that we need to make, now the data is in sync. We made those changes in Epicor. We made those changes in, in CAD, in, in some description I had to write back. All of that's done. Now data is in sync, and that's represented in the counting screen by having no highlighting. Now this, this one is an exception, right? <clears throat> this item that I manually added needs to be highlighted to, to differentiate from the rest. So this will forever be this blue color uh, to, to let you know that this was manually added by you. But the rest of our bill of material data is completely white, meaning there's no discrepancies. The bomb data in Epicor matches exactly to what we have in CAD. All right, let's get back on the presentation. Just a quick uh, summary on what you want to look for when we when you consider CAD to Epico integration, starting with the basics. No more Excels. You gotta start with Excel, CSVs, XMLs, right? Let, let's, let's move away from that export, import, Excel file uh, process. Live comparison, no more blind push, right? You need to be able to have these kind of comparisons shown in the in the visual interface, right? Sometimes it can be it can be very difficult or impossible to spot the difference between what you have in Epicor now and this new bill of material. Comparison is very important. The intuitive and visual interface, right? The screen that we just saw, the highlighting, and data validations, right? The accuracy matters especially in, when we're talking about Epicor ERP system, right? The data in ERP that you rely on purchasing, schedule, production, right? All of that relies on the accurate data. So the accuracy matters, the validation is important. Now, that, those are the basics. Now let's take a look at the adaptability, right? Because every company have certain unique needs. And we have, um, you know, we continually improve our counting product with Epicor, and we have new uh, module that allows you to do an extended field mapping. So beyond the, some of the fields that you saw in the demo today, you, you know, with this extended field mapping module, you can add your own field mapping, right? You don't need to come to, to Epicor or you don't need to come to QBuild to customize this. You can add and create your own field mapping, the Epicor part table, part material table for the, the, the bomb component information, or even job material, quote material table, including all the user-defined field that you create on these tables, right? You can, you can control your own mapping. And you can create your own logic, right? Again, in the past, any kind of custom logic that you want to implement in, 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 in some of these applications, you have to contact the provider like QBuild and we do the customization for you. But now we have a module that allows you to write your own custom logic that Calnic will use. You can use this for things like setting uh, uh, default values on, on certain epical fields based on a logic, overriding certain bomb quantities, right? If you have someone who's knowledgeable in these uh, programming language, uh, C Sharp, to be specific, we use C Sharp in Calling. If you have someone who knows how to write these simple code, you can create your own custom logic yourself and you have the control of that, right? You can, you can change and update and upgrade your, these logics. All right, so that's adaptability. What about some of the other 
common type of needs, right? So again, we have a different modules as well as a standard functionality in counting that allows you to handle these different scenarios, different needs. Like, you know, some of you might say, you know, we build our product once, right? We never make the same thing twice. Our engineer needs to create the bill of material directly to the job in Epic. Well, we have a job integration. We have a job bomb integration. The same integration that you just saw in the demo, but now you can run it against a specific job. So we're not populating the engineer workbench. We're populating the, the specific job that you pick out. Or the quote, right? If you wanna if you wanna put the bill of material from the CAD into the quote for estimating purpose, you, we have the quote bomb integration as well. If you're wondering about how can we take that engineer's CAD bill of material and turn it into a, a manufacturing bill of material? We want to restructure the engineer's bill of material to fit our manufacturing needs before we put it into Epicor. Well, we have a module for that as well. We have a Calnic MBOM module, which was specifically designed to let you take that bill of material out of CAD uh, and Calnic and use this MBOM module to manipulate it, turn it into a more manufacturing ready bill of material. So those are additional modules that we provide for some of these common needs. And we also have the, some of the standard functionality, some of them I talked about um, in the demo. File attachment, uh, I didn't show that in the demo, but that's a standard functionality. You can link documents like PDF of drawings, and we do support Docstar. Uh, adding non-CAD items, I showed that, right? That blue items, the manual part consumables, packaging, you can add that through Calling. That's a standard functionality. And if you want to add raw material level, right? If you have, if you want to capture stock material that you're going to use to make some of these manufactured parts, you can use Calling to add those raw materials as well. Lastly, more future-proof, right? Uh, looking forward, change control process, right? Many of our customers start with Catlink, and once they have this connection between engineering and Epicor so that they can easily and accurately get the data from CAD into Epicor, then they start talking about, well, how can we make sure that the right people are notified that this change is happening? Change notice, right, ECN. We have an ECN manager, which is a separate application that hooks onto both Catlink and Epicor that adds the approval process, right? Documenting these changes before it, it, it's made in Epicor and letting different people receive and approve, review and approve these. And they can also see the impact that this change will have based on the Epicor inventory, open POs, open jobs, right? You can recommend dispositions. So you know exactly what's changing and you know exactly what needs to be done Right, so that's the change control process, and we have ECM manager for that. The scalable solutions. As your company grows, as your engine team grows, if you don't have it right now, you might your engine team might start looking at PDM system, product data management system, or sometimes they're also called as a vault, right? Control their CAD file. Or maybe you're gonna take a step further and, and look at the PLM system, product life cycle management system, right? All of these systems that engineers may implement future, in the future as your company grows, does your CAD, uh, does your Epico integration support these PDM PLM system, right? That's an important question. And, and with, with us, with Calling, because of our partnership relation with these CAD providers, we also have integration available for their PDM and PLM system, right? SolidWorks PDM, Autodesk Vault, Team Center PLM, Winter PLM, all of these PDM PLM packages we support those integration as well. Sustainable solution, right? You don't you don't want to be stuck with a custom solution that forces you to stay on a certain CAD version, certain Epical version, right? You want a solution that has a sustainable um, upgrade path, right? You want to be able to upgrade CAD. You want to be a, be able to upgrade Epical without having to worry about, will this break this integration, right? So you wanna go with the official integration partner that Epicor ha have certified, and also you wanna look for the official integration partner that your CAT provider has certified, and obviously the CalNIC meets both of those criteria. And the last one, cloud ready, right? 
you know, we, we can't get away from this. You know, it, it's coming. The cloud, you know, we, we see it everywhere. We hear it everywhere. Let's make sure the integration that you have is cloud ready, right? And Calnic is. So those are some of the um, some of the things that I wanted to share with you when we talked about engineering to Epicor integration, CAT to Epicor integration, what to look for, what are some of the things that you need to consider. Now, with the time I have left, I also want to share some of the other opportunities we have or you may have for automation outside of the CAT to Epicor integration and the bill of material data integration. The first one I want to talk about is this integration called Config Link, which is a link between your Epicor product configurator and your CAT system. Now, if you use Epicor product configurator already, you know, your salesperson can just open up, put in all the, the inputs in a form, and you know, you get the pricing information, right? Well, what if you want to get an image? What if you want to get a CAD drawing? What if you want to see the 3D rendering of this configured product? What if the customer wants to see this information? What do you need to do? Well, you have to go talk to the engineers. Config Link eliminates that because Config Link will hook up your Epical configurator with your engineer's CAD system and their CAD model. So based on the configuration inputs, your, your salesperson can immediately, right away, get CAD drawings, 3D model, or, or JPEG of the 3D rendered image that you can use in quoting, you can use it to share you with your customers, and it's all automated. Now we have uh, one case study I wanted to, I want to quick share, I want to quickly share with you, and that is the Bruno. They manufacture these automated uh, indoor, outdoor stair lifts for, for people in a wheelchair, right? And, and they have both commercial team and a residential team, and, and our project was specifically for these residential Right, insulting these lifts to people's porches and things like that. They've been using Epical Configurator for these residential vertical lifts. Very complex configurations, right? The tower can be on the left side, the right side, the door can be here, it swings this way, swing the other way, right? Because you have to install this on, on someone's home, so there's a lot of configuration factors that goes into it. And they have been using Config Link since 2015 now. Now the challenge they had was that they, there was there was no validation process, and they were actually getting 10 to 15 percent error rate in terms of wrong products going out the door. Now what was happening was that the, it's not like the production people were making mistakes. The problem was that when the salesperson and, and their dealers talk to their customers, the, the homeowners, and then go through the configurator, right? Uh, you know. How, how big of a tower do you want? Which side do you want it? They go through all the inputs, right? And that you have this paper with all the inputs. And the customer says, okay, yeah, that looks good. You manufacture that according to the configuration. And when it arrives at the door, the customer says, that's not what I want, right? That's what was happening for them. The customer couldn't visualize what they were ordering, what they were asking for, and they couldn't confirm it. So when they saw it, they realized, ooh, that's not what I want. That was a challenge. Now, with Config Link, what they were able to do is automatically generate a 3D rendering image of those vertical lifts where you see the tower, you see the door, you, you see exactly how, how large and which, you know, what orientation, you know, all the parts are, right? The picture is worth a thousand words. The customer relations specialist at Bruno said, you know, it's, it's a great tool for verifying configuration with the tower side, the door swings, right? The end users, the customers, they love to see what the lift it will look like, right? So it's a great sales tool, not just a, a tool to save engineers time, not just a tool to improve the, the production uh, accuracy and quality, but it's a great sales tool. The success we have with the Bruno, the, you know, all the good things that we just talked about, right? Order acknowledgement via visual representation. The customer sees what they're asking for. Right? You confirm that, 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 that is what they're, or what they want. Uh, and being able to generate these drawings and images, the service team has a quick access to these uh, these, these uh, CAD files, right? Engineers don't have to create them themselves. It's automatically generated by config link based on your configuration input and, and using engineer's CAD system. 
right? Their ethical job travel also has a visual representation to help the guys on the shop floor. And they saw 87% reduction in the error, right? So that's a very positive um, a result that we, we achieved with Bruno with ConfigLink. Now, the next integration I want to talk about is the one that's just showed up on the right-hand side, nest link. This one is not a CAD integration. This one is integration with your nesting tool. This is, nesting tool is, is a tool that your production, your shop floor people use for cutting, you know, flat pattern, you know, sheet metal plates, right, using water jet cutter, lasers, burners, whatever it might be, right? If you use nesting tool, we now have an integration between Epicor and your nesting tool on the shop floor, like Sigma Nest, like Pro Nest, Ensa, or Cutrug, and it's called Nestlink. This is a new product, and this is a new addition. And your success story can can be here. So it, most of our Nestlink customers are just about you know to go live or you know still you know implementing it because it's a new product that we've introduced in the last uh, year and a bit. But to give you a little bit of information, basically what this is, is an integration between Epicor and, and nesting, nest, uh, nesting software. So for example, your, your nester, the guys who needs to use this nesting application. When you get a huge order and you create this job in Epicor, you create demands for these sheet metal items that you need to cut, nest and cut. Someone, like this Ned the Nester, someone has to sit there and, and basically type in all of that demands in their nesting software because nesting software needs to know what they need to cut, how many they need to cut, by what due date they need to cut, you know, these sheets, right? All of that data is in Epicor, but because these systems are not talking to each other, someone has to do that manually. Very time consuming. Now there's also the flip side. Someone who is on the Epicor side, they would be dying to get some of the data nesting application has, right? So after you do the nesting and after you do the cutting, the actual cutting, this nesting application has a lot of useful information, like what material was actually used, how much scrap was generated, how much remnant was generated, how, how much remnant we put back in the inventory, the actual runtime, how long did the machine took to run it, right? All of these good information is in a nesting application, but we don't get that in Epicor because these systems are not talking to each other, right? To get that data over into Epicor, again, we need to have someone to manually type in all that data, extract and all, type in all that data in Epicor and who has time for that. So that's the, that's the, um, the base, basic uh, overview of the Nestlink application. It's a bi-directional link so that when you create a demand in Epicor for these nested items, we can automatically send all of that into the nesting software. Nobody has to manually put that in. Or even, even inventories, right? When you receive a new sheet metal, new plates in stock, right? You receive that in Epicor. We need to make sure that the nesting software knows that there is a new plate, new sheet metal sitting in our stock, right? Nobody has to do that manually in a nesting application. We can automatically create and update those inventories and sheet, um, uh, sheet uh, information in a nesting software. And then going the other way around, right? After we actually do the cutting, how much did we consume? How much is left? What was the scrap? How long did it take, right? All of that information the nesting software has can be transferred back to your jobs. So you, you, you have much more accurate job costing information. Uh, and you, we, some of these data might also go back into the inventory, right? If, we, if you track remnants, if you put those back into your inventory and you handle that in Epicor, you know, that can be automated as well. So if you use a lot of nesting, right? If you have a lot of sheet metal parts that you, you use in your design or maybe your business is about getting customers, you know, your customers design and, and, and using your, shop floor tools to cut all these flat pattern parts. Let us know. We should talk, see what kind of automation, what kind of integration we can create between your Epicor and your nesting, uh, nesting application. So with that, uh, I've pretty much used all the time I have left. Um, 
but with uh, some time we have left, I want to open it up for Q&A, and I'm going to just keep this slide open so that you have our contact information and, again, the additional deep dive session uh, with QBill at 340 Central. And, you know, if you have any questions, uh, we'll love to hear it there as well. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for your presentation. Um, I can see there was one question on our chat here. Um, mm -hmm. Who do you expect to verify the product group, part class, and other setup data? It, is it all on the engineers? I mean, those are Epicor product group, part classes. Right. So, um, so you saw those fields in the Calic interface, and you, you saw how the engineer, the, someone using Calic, is able to set them. But it's it's not necessary always, you know, uh, it's up to the engineers to, to to set them correctly. That really depends on the customer. Some customers do have engineers being in charge of that. Uh, some customers will have the custom logic that, that I talked about, right? They will say, you know, engineer is not going to know how to set this correctly, but there's a logic we can follow, right? So, so that would be a good example where they have all these different logic in place based on the part numbers or you know, other, other property value to drive those automatically so the engines don't have to do it themselves. Now, obviously, in Epicor, there's a lot of data when it comes to new part creation. And we do not expect every single property in, in fields in Epicor to be populated by engineer and camera. There needs to be a process after the engineer runs counting where, where certain people are notified, maybe through your Epicor you know, notification, the new part was generated. These people get notified so they can go in and check or they can add additional details, right? So that, that still has to be there in, in terms of the overall process. Uh, but there are different ways that you can handle those Epicor specific fields in counting, either through a user doing it manually or putting in some kind of logic so we can automatically set them correctly. Okay. Uh, there's a question of can the buyer buy? Can you buy Nestlé software separately? Is it bi-directional exchange with Epicor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so Nestlé is completely separate application from the Calink. So you are able to just buy the Nestlé application now. Uh, and yes, it is a bi-directional data exchange between your Epicor and your Nestlé application. So you know, if you are interested, <clears throat> um, you know, we'd we'll love to talk. Uh, does it work with Salvagini's nesting software? Hmm. That one, me personally, uh, I'm not familiar with that software. Uh, so, Calvin, I think we should connect. Um, you know, we should have a discovery call. Uh, again, just like the Catlink, our goal with the Nestlink is to be able to provide this integration regardless of what nesting software you use, right? And we started with a few CAT system, and now we have 35, probably 40 different CAT, PDM, and PLM that we work with. So if you have a need, and if we haven't integrated with Sal Salvagini's nesting software, let's talk. We'll be happy to contact them and you know, form a partnership so that we can provide this integration for your tool as well. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Naoki. Um, and I think there was one more question that? at the very beginning about material from Calvin as well. Um, he was asking, how do you link the materials to the correct operation so the time when the materials come in and match uh, the billable, uh, billable operation? So that's one thing I did kind of skipped over. I'm glad you asked. Uh, you are able to set a related operation on individual billable or line item in Calink. Uh, in fact, if I just go back in quickly here. Yeah. So I could have done this, right? By, by default, Epico will assign to the first operation sequence because it didn't set anything. But using this column, I could have, in Calnix, specified exactly which operation sequence each of these material needs to be consumed at. So, so I think that would probably answer your question. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And um, Ryan Witt had a question about cost. And um, he's with Ag Leader, so I will reach out to our CAM and we can... Um, Mm -hmm. Get him some costing on that. Um, Eric yeah. had a question about will ECN manager be part of the deep dive? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think the I think the plan is for the deep dive. We we make it kind of an open session. So any of the product that I mentioned today, that doesn't need to be just counting. ECN manager, 
the, the M-Bomb tool, Job Bomb, Co Bomb integration, Nest Link, Config Link, any of the product that I mentioned today, uh, I think we can make that deep dive session kind of open ended so that, that you can talk about any of those products with us. Super. Um, Isaac's asking when you make a new rev to a part, will it load the new rev? Does it unapprove the previous one? <clears throat> All right. Well, good question. And these are some of the things you know we'll be happy to discuss in the deep dive as well. Uh, so, Isaac, there is a setting in Calink that allows you to first of all control whether that new revision that we create through Calink automatically gets approved or not. Automatic the bomb gets automatically checked in or not. And there is another setting uh, that will let you decide whether, if you are approving those new revs that Calink is creating, whether you want Calink to automatically unapprove all the revisions. So exactly what you're saying. It's a setting. You can control it. It's up to you. Sounds good. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I think the phone, the everybody is off mute, so we can ask questions via the phone or the chat. Do you ever have people um, setting up these properties, like even operations in the, the CAD software and sucking that in? Okay. The operations in CAD, I would say, is very, very rare for us, um, especially if you're using a, a typical, like a, a generic mechanical design system, like SolidWorks, Inventor, and things like that. Right? I, I find it very uncommon. I have seen it maybe once or twice, but I, I do find it very rare. Now, if we start talking about some of the very specific, uh, industry-specific CAD system, like certain CAD system that are designed specifically for the, the furniture making and woodworking and things like that, I have seen that those CAD systems are, are a little bit different from like uh, SolidWorks and Inventor in that they might capture some of the routing type details. Um, so, you know, that's something we're happy to discuss with you, right? You know, if, whether your current process you know, captures operations in your CAD or not, you know, if you if you have an idea, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to talk about it. Um, it will require some customization, um, but you know, as long as there's there's a data available, uh, you know, we might be able to read it and automate it uh, as well. What's the typical implementation time? I'm sure it depends on like the size of the company and everything. But... Uh, for for Calink? Yeah. Okay. So Calink, uh, yeah, it, it does depend, but I would say typically um, four to six weeks will be a pretty pretty common implementation if it's uh, if it's like a standard integration. Uh, without a customization um, now you know if we start talking about potentially customizing it you know, maybe we might extend into like eight weeks you know a little over two months uh, but it's definitely not a it's typically not a, like one year or six months project maybe it's like you know, even on the longer end two to three months maybe okay um uh, there's a question about the export function yes so uh, I think you're referring to this, right? So yeah, with from here, if you do this, export bomb to Excel, yes, it does export this grid that you see here into the Excel file with the colors. So if I did the export while there was all those greens and yellows, I, I would have get the Excel file with all those highlighting as well. Do you ever have people pulling costing in from Epicor when you come into Catlink to merge it to get costing quick? Yeah.
Nyoki, did you hear that last question? It was whether or not if people had ever been pulling costs in. Oh, sorry, I didn't yeah, catch it. Uh, pulling in costs in from CAD through Calnic into Epic Core. No, I think it was the opposite way. I was like, which way did you want Oh, the to other way it? around. Yeah, but basically, if you suck your solder film material in um, to CadLink and then have it pull the data from Epicor on the cost and you could get like a quick cost and what a new assembly would be. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, it's not unheard of. Um, I would say it's on the rare side of the customization, but we are able to do that, right? We can read the cost information from Epicor and write it back to the CAD property at the time of, you know, engineers doing this, right? So the trick, I guess, <clears throat> the kind of a tricky thing is that, you know, cost information on Epicor side might change more frequently than engineers, you know, changing the bomb and updating in Epicor, right? And Calnic is always used when engineers are changing the bomb in Epicor after they finish designing it, right? So at that time, we can do the sync, right? To get the latest cost information from Epicor, but, you know, Few weeks or months down the road, the cost information they have in the CAT property may no longer be up to date with what's in Epicor, unless engineers kind of make it a habit to, you know, constantly run this integration just to see if the cost has changed or not, right? Even if the bomb has to change. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, thank you to both Kahu and Aoki for your presentation so far, and we'll see you guys again about 3.40 for the deep dive. And so come back, think about more questions and what else you guys want to see, if you want to stick it in the chat, or we'll tackle tackle those questions in, in that deep dive session. And I appreciate um, you guys coming on today and doing your presentation for us. Yeah, we'll talk again later. Thank you, Christine. Yep. Um, Thank so you. I, we have about a yep. We have about a ten minute break. Um, kind of stretch our feet a little bit. We can have Fred get ready by ten thirty. Um, does that work for you, Fred? Or Calvin? Yep, that's fine. Yep. That okay. should work perfect. perfect. Yep. And then we'll tackle business intelligence, what it is, why you use it, or any of the tools that are out there that you've been exposed to so far, and we'll go from there. So we'll take a little break, and uh, we'll see everybody back here at 1030. The, the go-to meeting will continue to stay on. We'll just probably just, you know, mute people, and um, or we can... I'll leave it open if anyone wants to have, yeah, open dialogue is fine for the next yeah. 10 minutes. Go ahead and throw questions out. Yep. We'll keep Come on, Christine, open. this is when we walk out of the little room, we go get a refreshment, hit the washroom, and talk in the hallways. Yep. Find your Germex bottles. Wash your hands. <laughs> This is when we network. This is our face-to-face, unface-to-face network opportunity, right? I know, but I'm, I'm just thinking you just did virtual social distancing. That's hilarious in a remote meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> we got to have some fun with this or we're going to go nuts. <laughs> Exactly. I'm sorry. It just made me really laugh when I thought of that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. For anybody who's on still, if you have any questions for myself, Calvin, Fred, or any of the other attendees, if there's something you guys want to share. Um, I'm in dialogue with 
Christine Hansen. She's trying to get me in touch with uh, Terry Hinsky or Cindy Valdez to pop on at 2 o'clock today. We should hear back something from them. I've had a sub chat going with Epicor on the other screen. So we should have an answer and an update for insights for everybody. Super, super. Um, do we have any of our, our Iowa cams on here? I know uh, Aaron was popped on earlier. I'm just trying to figure out, um, you guys, I know everyone in Iowa pretty much got a new cam this go around. And so I don't know if you guys wanted to do a little introduction or if you talked to all your customers already. Or... So, hey, are we all still open for Q&A? Bring it on. Yep. Go, go all for right. it. Hey, we just started, <clears throat> excuse me, just started implementing a material burden rate. Um, so I just took the DMT tool and mass dumped into the all our part masters what our uh, burden rate is against purchased materials. But is there somewhere that we can when anybody engineering makes a new part number that it comes in as default or what's the best way to keep that burden rate coming on new part numbers? I don't want to have to yep. run a DMT tool weekly, you know. No, no. What you would do is set up a method or a data directive on adding a new part to set the default values. You can also control like your costing method. Some of your defaults that you want on the part, regardless what they enter. Now, we, you wouldn't do that for a product group or a material type or a class or something, but you may want to set that for uh, costing size. Is it inventoryable if it's a purchase part? Some of those can all be set using a data directive so that when you add a new record, you just set the value equal, like costing method would be A for average, S for standard. Um, material burden rate could be 5%. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, we dug around looking for uh, the template, if you will, when the part master is made, that, and we weren't seeing that as an option. So, yeah. But, you uh, can do that on a pre-process or a post-process on the get new part to set the default value for that, or on a data directive when the record is added that it sets it. If it already has a value, I wouldn't change it back to the default because then if you wanted to go from 5% to 7%, you can increase it. Putting it on a data directive would kind of lock it on that record. Sure. Okay. And that's the same for any of the master tables. You can do that with a data or method directive when the user gets a new record. So it's not just for part master, but you could use that for customer settings or supplier. Sure. Well, I got another one if we got more time. Where um, are we? Fire over here. Uh, back flushing materials. Is there a way when uh, a specific operation, you know, a, a sub-assembly and, and its operation that a part is related to is shown as completed, that it would back flush just that parts that are related to that one operation? You know, the so back flush setting is on the, it's on the part record itself. So regardless where it is in the bomb, So is it, yeah, whenever that operation it's associated to shows completed, it'll back flush because the part Correct. is set in the back flush? Correct. What, what? Can you, hey, so in, seriously. In the job. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what the part staying home working. So um, each individual job, you could change that though, right? To, Maybe typically this part would be a back flush, but maybe in this specific job, I don't want it to be a back flush. We just have to go uncheck that box 
in that bill of materials? Uh, no, because the back flush isn't on the bill of material. It's on the part record itself. So any bill of materials that that part is used in becomes a back flush part. Okay, no or nothing. No. Yep. Okay. okay. All right, got another one for you. Fiori. Um, on our price list, what we sell things for, is there a history, price list history? Like when your, your purchased price list, you know, your vendor price list, there's a history and as those prices change, but I'm not seeing it in the our sell price list. You know, what or you would do with there? the price list for having a history, on the actions menu in price list maintenance, there's an export and import. So you would export the price list and then re-import it with new effective dates. And then you just deactivate the old one. So it's always in there. It just isn't effective anymore, but you can always see the history, what the price lists were over time. The only drawback with that is you need to go through all the customers and update them to link them to the new price list that went into the system. Yeah, yuck. But it's a way to keep them or just export the price list into Excel, put them out yeah, on. Yeah, that's where we're at today. Yeah. Okay. All right.